Hello, friends. So I'll be giving a brief overview on this uh, venous thromboembolism prophylaxis or DVT prophylaxis and management current guidelines. So this talk I had given few years back. So I'm just redoing this for one of the webinar talk. So we to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Meza, who is the leader of this content. Uh, so the topics that I would cover is a problem overview. So whether uh, venous thromboembolism is a problem in ICU. And we'll talk about DVT prophylaxis in medical patients, risk factors. And uh, there are a few prediction models, uh, like there is a Padua score, there is an improved score, Caprini score. So I'll just talk about the simpler ones, which are Padua and improved score. And we'll talk a bit on studies on acute prophylaxis, anticoagulants versus placebo or low molecular weight heparin versus placebo. And uh, we'll talk about prophylaxis in select uh, high-risk patients like prevail study and the protect study. So we'll talk a bit on that. And uh, we'll talk on extended prophylaxis, uh, exclaim study, adopt study, and Magellan study. So these are some of the studies which are the landmark studies that we will just talk on and then the treatment. So these are the some of the contents that I would be covering. So when we talk about DVT prophylaxis in uh, medical patients, so in 2003, United States survey, uh, so in 38 million patients who were discharged, there were around 15 million patients who were of medical cases, out of which they looked at the stratification, 51% of them qualified to be at a risk for venous thromboembolism. So this is the burden of its risk in medical patients. So around 15 million medical patients who were discharged, out of which half of them were found to be at a risk for venous thromboembolism. And pulmonary thromboembolism is claimed to be one of the common preventable deaths that one could keep in back of mind. And uh, pulmonary thromboembolism leads to 1 to 2 lakhs deaths per year. So this is the sort of epidemiological burden and the data that we have that it does have a significant burden on the healthcare uh, facilities. So when you look at the problem uh, overview, so there are a lot of uh, international agencies. There, there are this national quality forum and surgical care of inpatients, surgical general, JACO, and Center for Medicaid Services. All these uh, major international agencies have put prevention of venous thromboembolism as a number one strategy in the healthcare setting to improve the safety of the patients. And they have looked at the benefit enormously outweigh the risk when you are addressing the risk stratification. And preventing this is desirable and it is cost effective for the patient. So this is a sort of a overview of the problem that we have. And, and based on this, there are numerous evidence-based guidelines that have come up to try and guide the healthcare professional as to measures that one needs to undertake to prevent venous thromboembolism and the death. So just through showing some of the studies, so in patients who are on thromboprophylaxis, this is a large database, medical database from various studies where if you divide into surgical patients and medical patients with thromboprophylaxis, so you give thromboprophylaxis, the risk of venous thromboembolism significantly reduced in both medical patients and surgical patients. To the effect in surgical patients, patients being on thromboprophylaxis significantly reduced the mortality also. Although they did not find enormous mortality benefit in medical patients, but thromboprophylaxis, the single intervention of having patients on thromboprophylaxis in surgical patients reduces the mortality and reduces the risk of BT in both medical and surgical patients. So when you look at the risk factors in certain specific cohort of patients in pregnancy, we know that after 20 weeks, one out of 3,000 are do develop venous thromboembolism. But having said that, routine thromboprophylaxis is not recommended, but it is recommended in obese sort of a pregnancy or some or any pregnant lady or a, uh, who has had a previous venous thromboembolism. So they are at a risk, higher risk, and it is recommended they are on VTE prophylaxis. And it is shown that people who take a long journeys in the flight, there are a two to four fold increase in the risk of venous. Maybe in India, you could say someone who is traveling in the train and who is not moving around, they are also at a risk. So, and studies, there are studies which is done to show there is two to four fold higher risk in someone who has a long air travel and they are at a risk 
up to two to eight weeks after a air travel. So that is the sort of a burden epidemiologically we have. And they have done studies in these patients who have had a flight journey of 24 hours, median duration of flight journey for 24 hours. And they compared the ones who are on compression stockings and no compression. And they found venous thromboembolism did occur in 10% of these patients who are on a long flight journey for 24 hours. In about 10%, they do develop some sort of a venous thromboembolism. And there was a meta-analysis of 10 RCTs where someone, they looked at flight travelers for median duration of four hours and the venous thromboembolism risk was found to be with a not ratio of 0.1. It means you cannot negate someone who is flying uh, in air travel, who are doing air travel for a long journey. They are at a risk for venous thromboembolism. The longer the flight journey, the greater is the risk of them developing. So one needs to bear that in mind uh, when they are taking long haul flight journey. And these are the, some of the studies that are there. And uh, and it is shown that someone who is hospitalized, patient comes to the hospitalized, so they are at 130 times greater risk of developing VT. So that is the sort of a risk and it increases with age and it is shown to be higher in male patients. As you see, 60% of patients who are hospitalized are at a risk for venous thromboembolism and 45% of the patients who get discharged Within 90 days, they are at a risk of VT, which means to say the fact that someone gets admitted into the hospital puts them at a 60% risk of developing VT. And even after discharge, 45% of them would be at a risk up to 90 days. So these are the studies referencing to that effect. So that is something that one needs to keep in mind. And ICU patients are much at a, are, are at a much higher risk of developing venous thromboembolism. So as you see, so this is a very very large database study which uh, published by the Australian authors in 2011. If you look at the number of patients they have taken, 1,75,665 patients in 134 ICUs. And they have looked at this patient group for five years and they have compared in a group who had received thromboprophylaxis and who had not received thromboprophylaxis. As you see, the ICU mortality. This is an ICU patient, large ICU database of close to 2 lakh patients, 134 ICUs, stratified into two groups, the group which received thromboprophylaxis and the group which did not receive ICU mortality was significantly less at 6.3% and hospital mortality also significantly less uh, in the large group. So which means to say that putting them on BTE prophylaxis gives them a protective effect and does have a bearing on reducing the mortality. And the attributable mortality in ICU, if you see the highest Risk of mortality due to venous thromboembolism happened in cardiac arrest patients where attributable mortality is 15.4%, followed by metastatic cancer patients at 9.4%. And sepsis, which we commonly see in ICU, constitutes attributable mortality of 8% due to venous thromboembolism and trauma is 3.9%. So this is the risk burden in ICU. So all the ICU patients are at a moderate to high risk of VTE and putting them on simple VTE prophylaxis does have an impact on reducing the burden and reducing the mortality. And prophylaxis, when we speak, there are two types, primary prophylaxis and secondary prophylaxis. So the ideal prophylactic and primary prophylaxis is what is recommended or suggested or ideal. So there are certain characteristics of ideal prophylactic. So whatever prophylaxis you put should be safe and effective and there should be good compliance with the prophylaxis and the prophylactic agent should be easily administered and there should not be lab monitoring like warfarin. You can't use warfarin for routine prophylaxis because there is lab monitoring needed. So they should not have any lab monitoring and it should be cost effective. These are the typical characteristics of ideal prophylactic agents. So when we talk about prophylactic agents which fulfill this criteria of safe, effective, easily administered, no lab monitoring, some of them that are available are unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and there are 10A and 2A inhibitors which are oral agents. So these are the available armamentarium. Then you have mechanical devices like gradu uh, graduated compression stockings. And then you have uh, pneumatic compression devices. So these are some of the mechanical devices that you have in preventing VTE. So when we talk about VTE risk assessment, just pictorially, I'm just showing. So if someone who has had a stroke or at a higher risk of VTE, someone who is at, this is in ICU, VTE risk assessment in ICU, someone with a previous stroke, someone who is more than 60 years, someone who's had a previous venous thromboembolism, or someone who's having thromboflic sort of a blood dyscrasia, someone who's undergone surgery, 
and someone who's had a mi ischemic heart disease or heart failure they are at risk or someone who has a chronic lung conditions like copd or at higher risk and sepsis and we saw the attributable sort of a mortality due to venous thrombomyelitis it's at around 8% so sepsis is a risk factor blood becomes sticky they are at risk for venous thrombomyelitis or someone who has a cancer anywhere solid organ tumor or inflammatory bowel disease or someone who has a big catheter like dialysis catheter or central venous catheter most of sitting in the femoral line so these are typical sort of a risk stratification that you should think of in icu and most icu patients will have one two or more than two of any of these conditions and someone who is polytrauma are at a risk for venous thrombomyelitis and someone who is chronically bed bound so they are at a high risk so these are the typical risk stratification that you should keep in mind and you should just keep this picture in mind any of the icu patients that you will be dealing with will have at least more than 2 to 3 of these conditions that is displayed in the figure so there are few prediction models and the padua prediction model and promise uh, the easier sort of a risk stratification models if you look at padua so there very simplistically it says so one score is more than 70 years or someone who is at the same thing the figuratively what i showed someone who is at a stroke someone who is at an mi who is at a heart failure from our surgery get to and three is someone who's had a cancer or past vte so you score into thing and they have looked at vte frequency as you see group a who are high risk uh, and who are on anticoagulants so the vte frequency was 2.2% if there is no anticoagulants for this i think uh, the vte risk was 11% and low risk it was 0.3% so it had a good validation so if someone is at a higher risk and they are not on anticoagulants the risk of vte set sat at around 11% in this padua score and this was published and validated in nejm in 2005 and then you have this improve trial improve sort of a prediction which is also simplistic so someone who's had a previous vte thrombophilia current cancer age more than 60 years so it puts a risk at around 0.5% uh, if they have any of these conditions and one need not possibly memorize all these models they are all present in metcalfs So you can just put the score, and uh, you have now online sort of a tools which will give you the risk stratification. And uh, so they have done this particular uh, study uh, from Canadian group again a large data base of fifteen thousand one fifty six to see if risk factors really did portend someone developing VTE. As you see, when someone has had no risk factors, the VTE was point four to point five. But if they had all these risk factors which I mentioned. Someone who had a stroke, someone who had an MI, someone who had a surgery, cancer, previous venous thrombosis, thrombophilia, bed bound. The risk factors is around eight to eleven percent. So this was validated. So the improved trial and Padua sort of a story, improved Padua story is based on the validation tools where they found that having any of these puts them at a higher risk of developing venous thrombosis. So when we talk about risk factor summary, so you had Padua model, then you have this improved score, then you have a Caprini score. Which has around 80 variables. So I don't expect any of our listeners to memorize all this. You have online tools; you can put it. But simplistically remember that picture, and those are the typical sort of a risk factor profile that you should uh, bear in mind when you are addressing the risk sort of a the risk at which the uh, the risk for VTE that you would think your patient is in. So to uh, to summarize the sort of risk uh, risk profiling or risk factor, if someone is more than 40 years. and there is no mobility for more than or equal to 3 days with one of the thrombotic risk factors they are considered risk for developing venous thrombosis but for icu we are talking about icu patient very simple all icu patients are considered as moderate to high risk for vte so for us we don't need to memorize any of this for physicians at least they need to keep all this in mind for us all icu patients are moderate to high risk of developing vte so when we talk about acute prophylaxis Uh, there are three agents unfractionated heparin low molecular weight heparin and fondaparinex and these are found to be superior to placebo and there are multiple studies to show that and when you had to have a choice between low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin low molecular weight heparin is found to be superior to unfractionated heparin either you give unfractionated heparin which like heparin you give even bd or tid is inferior to low molecular weight heparin and studies have clearly shown that so these are some of the big studies that you can keep in mind so these are this is a meta analysis of 36 randomized controlled trials comparing the use of low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated with placebo 
and they found the use of low molecular weight or uh, unfractionated significantly reduced the risk of DVT. As you see, the confidence interval is significant. And the risk of PE also was significantly reduced, but mortality, there was no difference. And here they compared unfractionated heparin twice daily and thrice daily. And they found thrice daily superior to twice daily of unfractionated heparin. And uh, so this study was published by, uh, in Archives of Internal Medicine in 2007. And here they compared low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin as a part of this systematic review. And they found DVT was significantly less in the group which got low molecular weight heparin. And as you see, the confidence interval is significant. And then when they looked at bleeding or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, there was no difference between low. So in this meta-analysis, which is possibly the largest study, taking 36 randomized controlled trials, it shows when you compare placebo with unfractionated or LMWH, unfractionated LMWH significantly reduces the risk of ETE. But between LMWH and unfractionated and un low molecular weight heparin is superior in reducing DVT further than when compared to unfractionated heparin. So this is a good sort of a data that we have. So, so this is a, a prophylaxis in select group of patients. So in ischemic stroke, these are all landmark studies. So this was a prevail study which came in Lancet in 2007, where they looked at 1,762. This means someone who's had a previous stroke who's come to your ICU, 1,762 patients comparing low molecular weight heparin versus unfractionated. Risk of venous thromboembolism was significantly less in LMWH group and bleeding, there was no difference. This is a prevail study ischemic stroke patients. PROTECT study, again, this is in critically ill patients. Pro PROTECT study was in ICU patients where they compared low molecular weight heparin, daltiparin with unfractionated heparin and they showed that PT was significantly less in daltiparin, DVT was less, mortality and bleeding, there was no difference. So these are some of the studies to substantiate how valuable it is to use VTE prophylaxis and when you have to pick up PT prophylaxis, you have to think of low molecular weight heparin as superior to unfractionated heparin. Then you have this uh, contemplation whether should you use this DVT prophylaxis as long as they are in ICU or should you use it for an extended period of time? That's the question that you would have, isn't it? So when you say extended prophylaxis, it is using prophylaxis for 10, 28 days. So these are the studies. This is an exclaimed study which came in Annals of Internal Medicine where here, they compared enoxaprine 40 mg for 28 days versus placebo for 28 days. And as you see, VTA was less when they gave for extended. But all the extended uh, prophylaxis studies showed bleeding risk was much higher. So if you give it for 28 days, bleeding was higher. And this was another other study called ADOPT study, which came in NEJM. Here, they took high-risk patients, like patients with congestive cardiac failure or who have renal failure and who's had a length of stay of ICU more than three days. Here they compared enoxaprine for 6 to 14 days and compared with oral antigen. After the enoxaprine, they went on for apixaban for 30 days. And as you see, there was no mortality difference. They looked at mortality at 30 days due to mortality due to venous thromboembolism and pulmonary thromboembolism. There was no difference. As you see, the confidence interval is not significant. But when they looked at bleeding, they had higher bleeding in extended prophylaxis. So the understanding is you have to very carefully select the group of patients for extended prophylaxis and cannot have as a blanket rule that all patients who come to ICU need to be an extended prophylaxis because the risk of bleeding is much higher. And this is a big study, Megalan study, which is also looking at extended prophylaxis, came from the Dutch group in 2013. Here also they looked at 8,101 critically ill patients who came to ICU, where they gave enoxaprine for 10 days and compared to rivaroxaban for 35 plus or minus 4 days. And as you see here, VT at 35 days, actually in this study, it showed significantly less in rivaroxaban. But if you see bleeding, again, bleeding was higher in extended prophylaxis. So there were three studies I showed you, Megalan study, ADOPT study, and EXCLAIM study, all sort of signal towards higher risk of bleeding. Megalan study shows significant reduction in sort of uh, uh, reducing the venous thromboembolism uh, at the end of 35 days. So that the Megalan study is the only one which showed reduction in the benefit. So the conclusion from all these three studies is extended prophylaxis with VTE prophylaxis is not beneficial uh, because the risk of bleeding outweighs the benefit is what we could decipher. So when you talk about fondoparinox, uh, 
It is similar to enoxaprine, and they have looked at aspirin. So they have seen that aspirin reduces the risk of arterial thrombosis, but has a minimal effect on reducing the risk for venous thromboembolism. And when you talk about anticoagulation warfarin, the, the anticoagulation effect is quite delayed. And this is only has to, and one has to bear in mind all the comorbidities that patient may be on when you're using warfarin. So when you look at graduated compression stockings, it has shown to have no benefit introducing the risk for BTE. And intermittent pneumatic compression, one needs to bear in mind if you have a peripheral vascular disease, one needs to be very cautious in do, using intermittent pneumatic compression. So there was this trial called a CLOT3 trial published in Lancet, which showed use of intermittent pneumatic compression, especially in a group where there is contraindications for pharmacological prophylaxis. It did show re reduction in venous thromboembolism uh, to around 8.5% when compared to the placebo of 12%. So pneumatic compression has some benefit in reducing venous thrombosis, especially when there is contraindication for pharmacological prophylaxis. So then there is this Jupiter trial, which has looked at the statins. So someone who, this is the last study published in NEJM. They took 17,802 patients and they found the use of statin along with VTE prophylaxis had a bearing on reducing the risk of symptomatic VTE because it occurred in 34 as compared to 60 and that was statistically significant. Statins also has some beneficial role in minimizing the risk for venous thromboembolism. So just coming to last couple of slides on specific recommendation summary. Now we have heard all that the extended prophylaxis, not much role, but ICU patients all need to have some sort of a prophylaxis is what we could decipher. And we also looked into the data or the literature as to how low molecular weight heparin is superior to unfractionated heparin. So we'll just look into the summary statement. If patient is hospitalized with no risk factors, thromboprophylaxis is not recommended. It's a grade 1B recommendation, strong recommendation moderate level of evidence. If patient is hospitalized but with risk factors, then thromboprophylaxis is suggested with unfractionated heparin or low molecular and to be discontinued after discharge from the hospital. Extended duration of prophylaxis is not recommended. Grade 2B recommendation, moderate recommendation with a moderate level of evidence. If patient has a risk factor but contraindication to pharmacoprophylaxis or thrombo thromboprophylaxis, then you can think of using graduated compression stockings and intermittent pneumatic compressions, grade 2C recommendation, moderate recommendation, peak level of evidence. And anticoagulation to be considered as soon as possible once the contraindication is eliminated. So that is the sort of recommendation that's come. In special groups, someone who is undergoing bariatric surgery with a BMI less than 50, and of the print 40 mg 12 thousand, when they are undergoing bariatric surgery. If someone is undergoing bariatric surgery with BMI more than 50, enoxaprine 60 mg 12 hourly. If BMI is more than 40 kgs, enoxaprine 40 mg 12 hourly. BMI 30 to 39, enoxaprine 30 mg 12 hourly. So these are some of the recommendations. And as I said, BTE prophylaxis in ICU. All ICU patients constitute moderate to higher risk. And it's a quality indicator. So this is the quality indicator. 90% of your ICU patients should be on BTE prophylaxis and FASTEG, which we adopt, um, T stands for thromboprophylaxis, and that needs to be adopted for all the ICU patients. And when you look at the guidelines, uh, which have endorsed all this, when you look at American College of Chest Physicians, American College of Physicians, Family Physicians, British Committee, so the recommendation is if creatinine clearance is less than 30 ml, then you can think of using unfractionated heparin or you can use even low molecular weight heparin like daltiparin. But low molecular weight heparin and fundopendence is preferable. Duration. What is the duration? If there is proximal DVT, this treatment, I'm talking about not prophylaxis. This is the treatment. If there is proximal DVT, then treatment duration is three months. Strong recommendation. If there is distal DVT, duration is three months. Moderate recommendation. And if there is a resolution of risk factors, then you need to stop once there is resolution of risk factors. Recurrent DVT. If someone has recurrent DVT, the anticoagulation is indefinite. And one has to look at reverse, reversing the risk factor. This is the treatment aspect. Oral anticoagulation therapy. Once you are on, you have initiated on anticoagulation with uh, low molecular, you have to switch over to oral anticoagulants. You can keep in mind epixaban or rivaroxaban or 
or dabigatran overlap and this has to be overlap with heparin or dabigatran or redoxaben. So there are special sort of a patients where there can be uh, contraindications. If there is contraindications to anticoagulations, IVC filter to be kept in mind. So grade 2C recommendation, moderate recommendation. So in patients who have malignancy or pregnancy and uh, low molecular weight, heparin is something that has to be considered, which is a moderate recommendation, weak level of evidence. And there is no role for long-term factor 10A inhibitor or direct thrombin, like rivaroxaban, epixaban, or dabigatron should not be considered, especially in patients who are on malignancy or in a pregnancy. And if someone is in a iliofemoral DVT uh, and uh, so thrombolysis or thrombectomy is something that one could consider if there is pelvic pain thrombosis. So post-thrombotic treatment, the recommendations are they have to be ambulated early and they need to be put on graduated compression. So these are all the recommendations or guidelines that are endorsed by all these American College of Chest Physicians or Heart Association, American College of Physicians and British sort of a guidelines. So these are the some of them. So things to consider, dosing has to be individualized to product. If uh, unfractionated heparin is used, ideally the serum levels have to be maintained at 0.3 to 0.7 units per ml. That gets a strong recommendation with moderate level of evidence. And if you are using if, uh, oral anticoagulants, there has to be overlap of oral, uh, newer oral anticoagulants with low molecular weight heparin or vitamin K antagonists like warfarin for at least five days before you switch over. And INR to be maintained at 2 to 3 and strong recommendations and good level of evidence. that This is INR one needs to maintain. But there has to be overlap that needs to happen when you are putting on vitamin K antagonists. And one has to keep monitoring platelet count and thrombolysis in a life-threatening situation and IVC filter when there is contraindication. These are some of the things to be kept in back of mind. So that's about the whole concept of VTA prophylaxis and treatment. Um, so I request all our listeners to attend our signature conference, JIC, that's happening from 18th to 20th October. So request our esteemed listeners to submit their valuable work to Journal of Acute Care. Visit my website. Thank you. Thank you very much.